Letters to a Young Therapist Part 4 Ball Chapter 21 Ethics September 20th Dear Laura, Let me tell you the story about an unlicensed therapist who wreaked havoc in my hometown. This smarmy guy found a lonely rich woman, and he scheduled several hour-long sessions a day with her, seven days a week. Alone in his office with the woman and her checkbook, he managed to seduce her and bilk her of her fortune. Then when she was broke, he abandoned her. She responded by swallowing a bottle of sleeping pills and had a mental breakdown. Her relatives, left to deal with the fallout of her collapse and her newfound poverty, reported the therapist to the health department. As quickly as he blew into town, he blew back out. By now, no doubt, he is defrauding clients in another state. Thank goodness there are not many stories as bad as this one. This guy was not just unethical, he was criminal. For the most part, psychologists who land in ethical hot water fall into three categories. Greedy manipulators, mercifully few. Inadequate people whose therapy clients are their only relationships, not many of these either. And isolated or burned out therapists who lose perspective, the largest group. Fortunately, psychology has the code of ethics to protect us and our clients. Some of the time the code and a few guidelines are sufficient. Hippocrates' famous dictum, physician do no harm, applies to many situations as does my mother's goodbye advice to us kids, be kind to each other. In clinical practice as in life, there are many problems that these simple guidelines don't address. I'm conflicted about using and sharing diagnoses with clients, insurance companies, or institutions. Diagnoses are still reasonably subjective, but even when the evidence for a diagnosis is compelling, I am uneasy about labeling anyone unless I can see that the benefits will outweigh the costs. I worked with a boy who could probably have been labeled as having obsessive-compulsive disorder. Oliver washed his hands so often they were chafed, and he insisted that every object he owned be in its right place. He worried far too much about his homework and his haircuts. Diagnosing Oliver might have qualified him for extra services at school, but I worried how the label might affect his own and others' view of him. Finally, I decided we could help Oliver without labeling him. His parents and I could discuss how to distract him from his ruminations. His family doctor could write a prescription if necessary. None of this required that we officially diagnose Oliver. We can't anticipate all of the events that a label may trigger, Diagnoses give and they taketh away. They lead us into and out of swamps. Before we diagnose, ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Will a diagnosis allow clients to get the help they need? Can the diagnosis hurt the client? Another ethical issue concerns the difference between understanding and approval. After I have seen clients for a while, I find it easy to understand why they act as they do but I must work to not confuse understanding with condoning. Sometimes the distinction is crystal clear. An abused child may torment animals or set fires, understandable behaviors but terrible ones. I can care for the child but dislike his behavior. Other times it is harder. A man raised by cold parents repeatedly seduces women then abandons them. I must make sure my knowledge of his history doesn't cloud my awareness that his attachment issues are someone else's heartbreak. This separation of understanding and judgment requires a certain mental finesse. Racists are an example of this thorny problem. The worst racist I ever worked with came from a hateful, abusive family. I felt great sympathy for the man who in some ways was much kinder than his parents. He sobbed in his office at the thought that his wife might leave him and take the children. But he was a member of a white supremacy group and somehow I had to deal with that fact. Finally, I told him that I couldn't work with him if he remained with this group. I so deeply rejected his ideology that it damaged our relationship. He left without paying and never returned. Another client wanted help dealing with the stress of her affair with a married man. Her goal was to convince this wealthy man to leave his wife and three kids and marry her. I told her that I didn't help clients reach goals that I believed would harm them or other people. I worked with a woman who dealt with all her sadness and anger by shopping. This woman was depressed, but not about shopping, which was her one pleasure in life. 
I made it a personal goal to steer this client toward volunteer work, walks, and good books. Laura, I don't tell you these stories to illustrate my exemplary work. In fact, in all these examples, I'm not sure I even did the right thing. The white supremacist left therapy angrier than when he came in. The gold digger eventually married the rich man, and I now see them almost weekly at the movies, the grocery store, or in cafes. Very awkward. The shopping client didn't like to walk on anything but pavement, and she preferred playing the lottery to reading Willa Cather. I tell you these stories to show that my values influenced my work. Over the years, many of my clients ended up back in college, playing classical music, or doing volunteer work, all activities I value highly. In spite of what some theorists suggest, in spite of what some theorists suggest, we can't claim to be and we shouldn't be value neutral. Our responsibility is to be honest with our clients about our values. Therapists are sometimes naive about evil. I remember one therapist who dated a convicted murderer recently released from our state prison. He was clearly a jerk, interested only in her body and her apartment, but she claimed she could see the good in him. Well, maybe, but I felt she was so non-judgmental as to have virtually no common sense. Compassion is only useful when coupled with clear-headedness. Being big-hearted and fuzzy-minded can get us in trouble. One of our ethical responsibilities is to evaluate who has the likelihood of harming others and to take steps to protect potential victims. If we suspect a man might assault his girlfriend, we have a duty to warn her. If we know an adolescent is shooting up heroin, we need to tell his parents and find him treatment. Finally, we have an ethical responsibility to know that we don't know everything. Every heart is a mystery, but sometimes mysteries are harder to fathom than others. It can be a stretch for middle-class whites to understand the issues of African Americans, the disabled, refugees, or the poor. Unless we make a real effort to learn about the environments that our clients experience, our advice is likely to be ridiculous. Older clients humble me. I'm a long way from age 80, and I can't imagine what it feels like. It seems presumptuous to give advice to someone who has had many life experiences I haven't encountered. How would I know how to cope with the loss of my mate, my siblings, my friends, and my home? Yet I have seen, and you will see, many older clients. And amazingly, sometimes we actually help them. With the exception of the fly-by-night, low-life, snake-oil salesperson, or the seriously misinformed, Nobody becomes a therapist to get rich. Therapists make enough money, though, and in a way, I'm glad we don't make more. If we did, we'd attract more rotten apples to our profession. Almost all of us are in this work because we want to help. We like people, and they like us back. Chapter 22, Story Doctors, September 21st. Dear Laura, on this day in 1944... My parents married in a redwood forest in Mill Valley, California. They wore their military uniforms. The sun was shining, and afterward they went with their friends to an Armenian restaurant on Geary Street in San Francisco. They had met in that beautiful city when Avis was an officer and Frank a seaman's second class assigned to shine officer shoes. Both were good-looking, energetic, and adventurous. As my dad put it, we'd try anything once. Their courtship was a dramatic tale, sometimes funny, but in retrospect poignant and filled with foreshadowing of their future troubles as husband and wife. My folks have been dead for many years, but I am grateful that my mother was a storyteller. As I rode along with her on house calls and to hospitals, she told me hundreds of stories. Fifty-eight years after the newlyweds stood under a redwood and said their vows, my parents shimmer in my memory. Yesterday, I ran into an old client of mine at the grocery store. Hal was wearing a shirt with a logo designed to look collegiate, only his college was Euphoric State. That made me smile because years ago, Hal had come to see me with depression. He was a truck driver with a dull, solitary life. I couldn't figure out how to help him until I asked questions about his past. What do you know about your birth? Were you a wanted child? What were you like as a young boy? How did you handle your first day of school? Hal had no answers to those questions. When I asked about family vacations, he answered, we never took one. When I inquired about family friends, he said, 
my folks kept to themselves. I asked about hobbies and interests, and Hal shook his head. He had almost no memories from his childhood or stories of his adult life. In fact, Hal had only one story. He was a sad, bored bachelor. Hal's folks lived isolated, suspicious lives. His dad had been nicknamed Lumpy for reasons no one remembered, but which I suspected related to a lack of charisma and low energy level. Lumpy prohibited talk at meals or while he was driving. When Hal spoke up, his dad would reply by saying, Who do you think you are? Or, If you think you're so damn smart, Hal quickly learned not to volunteer information. Hal's mom kept to herself. She clearly didn't think she was so smart. His sister was much older than Hal and married when she was 16. After dinner, Lumpy worked in his shop, and his mother read True Romance or crocheted silently in her bedroom. The loudest sound in the house was the grandfather clock that chimed every 15 minutes. Hal said, I liked that clock. We couldn't redo Hal's childhood, but we could reconstruct it. I helped him discover old stories and invent new ones for himself. His parents were dead, but I instructed him to call his sister and his aunt and ask for help filling in what I dubbed the missing years. He wrote down their memories and we embellished them. For example, his sister remembered how much he liked baking day. His mom and aunt would bake Swedish rye bread on Saturdays. Hal would slather a warm chunk with butter and cinnamon sugar and go sit out back in the maple tree to eat it. His aunt remembered him as always hungry. We made these slivers of memories into a life theme. He'd always had a deep appreciation for the flavor of life. He'd always been hungry for adventures and for human connections, and he still had that deep hunger, which he was now ready to satisfy. I gave Hal the assignment to bring in adventures from his current life every week. Hal doubted he could do this, but not surprisingly, when he started looking for stories, he found them. When he shared them with me, I encouraged him to recall significant events and sparkling moments. I asked about the meaning of events, such as running into an old classmate or helping an older lady with a flat tire. As we talked, these memories expanded. The high school classmate, who had been happy to see him, allowed Hal to reevaluate some of his school experience as positive. The flat tire incident became a story about his big heart and the rewards of helping others. There's a big difference between people who've had interesting lives and people who are interesting. That difference is storytelling. Events alone are not particularly compelling. Story illuminates motive, desire, and the complexities of the human heart. Just as good stories create healthy people and cultures, sick stories yield dispirited people and cultures. We therapists are primarily storytellers. Most clients need stories that allow them to view the world in more optimistic ways. Therapist Jay Haley encouraged therapists to help their clients conceptualize themselves as heroes of epics. He spoke of turning tragedy into musical comedy. Better stories allow our clients to see themselves as more heroic, passionate, and interesting. Once I saw a grandmother burdened with the care of her cocaine-addicted son's child. Miriam was whipped when she came in, depressed, low energy, and overwhelmed by her burdens. She saw her future as unending drudgery and herself as drab and pitiable. Crying throughout the first session, she said, I don't think you can help. Even God couldn't help me. Since she was a strong Catholic, I thought she might be receptive to a Mother Teresa comparison. I told her that her mission was to help the small and weak. Care of her grandson was important and noble work. I said, you can be proud that when duty called, you came running. That comparison didn't take the dirty diapers and crying baby away, but it gave Miriam a sense of honor. She agreed to return, and when she did, we looked for resources for her. I said, even Mother Teresa had a support system. Many couples need new stories. Argumentative relationships can be reframed as passionate. We can compare their turbulence to that of more glamorous couples, such as Madonna and Guy Ritchie, or Catherine and Petruchio from The Taming of the Shrew. At the same time, we can suggest that our clients have the stability to harness all that energy and turn it into sustained passion. 
Refugees often construct new stories. They come to America with memories of victimhood. I ask them what they can recall with pride. Often they remember acts of courage or generosity. Small changes in their stories can have big implications for identity. A young woman from Bosnia remembers that she protected her sister from being raped by pushing her behind a door when the soldiers came. This memory allows her to feel noble instead of just soiled. All is not a wasteland. Among the rubble, we can help our clients find buried treasure. As Isak Dinesen said, all sorrows can be born if they are put in a story. We can help make our clients' narratives richer, more complex, and hopeful. The most common way to do that is to respond to any sad story with the question, what did you gain from this experience? Amazingly, I have never had a client who didn't gain something. I'm proud to report that when I ran into Hal in the produce section, he told me a story. It wasn't the best story I've ever heard. He's no studs turkle, but it was a real story about a trip he took with his girlfriend to Yellowstone National Park. A bear broke into their car and ate their provisions. Hal chased it away. He was loved in the story, and he was a hero. Indeed, Hal's euphoric state t-shirt reflected a new reality for him. My parents didn't live happily ever after. They lived turbulently ever after, rather like Catherine and Petruchio. But they were both storytellers, and because of that, I experienced a rich childhood. Very little happens in my adult life that doesn't remind me of a story I heard as a girl. Sometime this fall, during supervision, Laura, let's put aside cases and just tell stories. They have kept us humans sane during long, dark seasons for many generations.